we have greatest honor to have this panel conversation with our first lady and with Archbishop Guzak. And conversation will be about future of Ukraine and about what we're striving for. And for me, this is one of the most important question of this war and uh, great honor. And Zani, floor is yours. Thank you, Victor, uh, and welcome all of you. And I'm also honored to be uh, moderating what I know will be an extraordinarily interesting conversation between two remarkable individuals. Uh, you need no introduction. Elena Zelenska, the First Lady of Ukraine, Boris Kudziak, Metropolitan Archbishop of Philadelphia for Ukrainian Catholics in the US, and of course, President of the Ukrainian Catholic University. Um, we're going to look forward today. We're going to look forward to Ukraine at peace, and we're going to look forward to the kind of country that you will have and that you will be creating. But I just want to take stock before we do that, because it's now what? Almost 11 months since Russia's unprovoked invasion changed the world as we know it. It was an attack, unprovoked attack on a peaceful neighbor. It's caused unspeakable horror, as, as you know. But also the remarkable, remarkable bravery and resistance of your country, I think, stunned the world. And it's a powerful testament to standing up for freedom, to standing up for democracy, to standing up for the values that we all hold dear. And I think as a result, the perception of Ukraine internationally, a country that, forgive me if I say this, but was known as somewhat chaotic and somewhat corrupt, has fundamentally shifted. Ukraine is now an exemplar, a moral exemplar to the world. And Ukrainian society, I think, is also changing and has changed and will change. And so I wanted to, I hope we can really talk about this, about what, how you think the world sees Ukraine differently and how Ukraine sees itself differently. And that you can, um, Archbishop, we can get your sense of the moral dimensions of this war. Um, so we're going to reflect on all of that. We're going to reflect on it in a combination of languages. So I hope you all have your, if you don't speak Ukrainian, which I'm afraid my Ukrainian is very, very limited, I don't, get your, um, get your microphones, your translations ready. It's translation channel number one is English. And uh, um, <laughs> uh, I was going to start with you, Olena, if I may. Um, how do you think the world now sees Ukraine differently? Thank you, Zani. Now, I will speak Ukrainian, so uh, wants to understand me. Uh, the world has seen Ukraine in a different tr light. I am sure of that. But I should say, alas, I say alas because it happened too late. But it has happened. Too long has Ukraine been in a gray zone of sorts, and uh, um, now the world has finally seen Ukraine and Ukrainians as we are. And we've uh, gone out of this uh, gray zone where we stayed unheeded by the world, unfortunately, again, as I say. And uh, the world has come to know what Ukrainians are, that uh, they are resilient, uh, they are brave, they are kind. Um, and uh, this inspires the entire world. I'm sure that the reason is uh, that people need superheroes, like in movies. So uh, they want to know that the good always prevails. And now they've uh, got superheroes, not a single person, but a whole nation. Uh, the, at this point, the analogy stops, unfortunately, because uh, in real life, nothing is uh, like movies and the reality. Superheroism heroism has a punishing price, and the price of human lives. And I'm sure that we will uh, remain in the focus of uh, the world's attention it uh, is the response of the normal nation, the behavior of normal people being attacked by the aggressor. And I uh, want the world to continue to be inspired when this um, horror ceases. What are the values that you, Archbishop, see as being exemplified by Ukraine today? <coughs> Maybe I will mention four points. 
and then I'll explain what those points uh, are connected with. First, it's God-given human dignity. Uh, there's a value for life. And there's a sense that that life is not just a legal guarantee or something that is politically protected or economically assured, but it is given from God. It's holy. It's sacred. You cannot violate it. Second is solidarity. You know, I came back to New York. I was in, in uh, Ukraine five times uh, since February, and I'm on my way now. There are 14 million people displaced from their homes. Half of them are internally displaced persons. When I came back once to New York, I suddenly realized walking the streets, wait a second, there's no street people in Ukraine. There's nobody lying on the curb. Those seven million people have been welcomed. They're in homes. They may be in schools, they may be in institutions, in monasteries, in churches, but they're not in big refugee camps. Seven million people. Seven million. Poland received four. Ukrainians, in solidarity, received seven million. It's amazing, solidarity. Third, subsidiarity. That's a tough one. What does subsidiarity mean? Anybody want to help? It's bringing responsibility and authority down to the lowest level, which gives people dignity, it gives them the right to decide, but it also makes them responsible. And that's what the Ukrainian army is. It's not top down. We've read about that in all the reports. And the fourth thing, a fourth point is common good. The sense of the common good, working together, realizing that this battle is not only Ukraine's battle, but it's a battle for freedom in the world. It's not a coincidence, Zanny, that these are the four principal points of Catholic social doctrine, which have been enunciated by Metropolitan Sheptitsky <laughs> for the first half of the 20th century, continued in the underground church. Uh, the head of the Greek Catholic Church, Lubomir Huzar, minority church, 8%. He became the number one moral authority. Victor went to his funeral, stood in line, uh, didn't go like a VIP. Uh, and, um, and it's continued today. And that is, that is very important for people to understand, that this is not deus ex machina, that it suddenly just happened. It's not that Ukraine has totally changed in one day. Yes, Ukraine is changing because war changes history very quickly. People just weren't watching. People didn't understand. Often it's because people look at money, power, factories, you know, cars, infrastructure, but there's more to human life than that. There's the soul, there's the heart. So it, it, in your view, it's the underlying values that underpin your faith coming out. Uh, Elena, do you, I'm, sh I'm sure you would agree with that, but are there areas and ways in which you think the, that Ukraine has changed and that, that perhaps it is these underlying values coming more to the fore, but in what ways do you think your society has changed? Мені здається, ми просто більше, як каже... I think, uh, like His Eminence is saying, uh, we've come to uh, understand ourselves better. You can compare it to the situation whereby a person faces a termin terminal illness, but then they recover and they start valuing every minute of their lives. So we live day by day and we value every day. A lot of foreigners uh, were stunned when we, they saw cafes, uh, restaurants uh, being open uh, last summer, people uh, were in the streets enjoying life and they asked us how come that people live this calm life uh, in a country at war. Uh, but it is possible because we value every day, we value every person um, uh, by our side. We have become uh, 
a human-centric country. We understand that tomorrow we might lose our nearest and dearest, so we have to give them our care and love today. And we know that when our children go to school, we are looking forward to their coming back because there is an opportunity, a possibility, um, minute as it might say, that they would never return. And I hope that we will preserve this feeling of unity and of enjoying life every minute after the war. In the process of uh, recovery of the country, uh, we will be uh, rebuilding it as an inclusive uh, society that heeds the uh, interests of every person, uh, people with uh, disabilities, people with uh, fewer opportunities, and we should build back better, and I'm sure that it will be so. Human, a human-centric country that will be inclusive in its in its rebuilding. Um, I, I want I want to touch on one element though that is. I think often talked about, we're at the World Economic Forum, there's a lot of talk about economy, there's a lot of talk about the, the military side, but one aspect that I think is, is perhaps spoken about less is what is the consequence of this on the society and on the mental health of Ukrainians, on the way Ukrainians are behaving, and, and, this, and, and frankly what scars will be left from this. And maybe I could ask you first, Olena, you know, I, I love the idea of an inclusive human-centric Ukraine, but how much do you worry about the the long-lasting consequences of what you are going through. Yes, these consequences will be uh, long-term. Uh, unfortunately, we are sure of that, and we should face uh, this reality, because uh, we should understand who our enemy is, and we should be prepared uh, for a long haul. All of us uh, in Ukraine now uh, do not live a normal uh, life. You cannot uh, describe our uh, state as normal. Uh, we feel this rush of adrenaline, and sometimes we behave, I would say, uh, to relax even during air uh, raids because we've been living this uh, through this situation for too long and uh, not a single person in Ukraine would um, say that they are okay but uh, at the same time there are people who suffered most uh, those who uh, witnessed the death of their nearest and dearest those who suffered themselves those who lost their homes uh, all of that uh, has has been caused by the war, and these wounds, uh, this trauma will stay with us uh, for decades to come. And uh, what pleases me is that Ukraine has started to address uh, the issues of today and those that will come down the road. We are developing the program of uh, moral health and so, uh, psychosocial support. We should establish such a model of psychosocial support within the national health uh, system uh, for it to be accessible to everyone, a model of psychosocial uh, support support that uh, will provide to everyone, cater to everyone. And if you pr uh, make um, timely and effective interventions, then in 90 percent, this trauma can be uh, worked with and can be overcome. Of course, we will have uh, um, people with disabilities. We will have um, uh, war veterans. We will have orphans. We will have a lot of uh, people with disabilities. Uh, uh, we will have people who don't have their homes anymore. And all of that, it's closely related with mental health. Health. Uh, today, we are here in Davos at a financial and economic forum, but mental health is uh, not just a public health issue. It is the social issue uh, because it entails a social behavior. It um, uh, entails abuse of uh, substances, suicidal uh, sentiment, etc. So we should uh, realize that uh, we are in for it and we will have to address all of those issues uh, 
tomorrow and uh, down the road. So yeah, an interagency group uh, with representatives of all concerned Ukrainian ministries uh, confirms this idea that we should stop right now. It's about the Ministry of Social Policy, Ministry for the Veterans Affairs, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Internal Affairs, Ministry of Education, and of course, Ministry of Public Health. All of them are engaged. All of them work together uh, in concert. And uh, now uh, we have designed a communication campaign that will get this message across to every Ukrainian, how they should recognize those symptoms, what they should do, how they should uh, contribute to overcoming stigma uh, that unfortunately exists in our society whenever you use this word psycho. And we are doing our best to prevent uh, those potential uh, aftermaths. And for the Archbishop on the same subject. Uh, Thanks a lot for reminding uh, to me, Your Eminence. Um, uh, you are the president of Ukrainian Catholic University, which uh, is engaged in uh, the national program of um, mental and psychological health, uh, for which we are extremely gra grateful to you and the university. So they are uh, developing uh, treatment protocols, uh, medical protocols, etc. But my question is not about that. The church has always had its own uh, methods of uh, providing psychological psychological support uh, to um, uh, its um uh, uh, people. So have you uh, got any new challenges uh, during this large-scale invasion? And what uh, uh, responses have you found to those challenges? I think you've named the challenges. The, the challenges facing everybody, the church included. What are the, what are the answers? Uh, they are, they are in a process, but there's a fundamental approach to the answer. The trauma, the orphans, the amputees, uh, the psychological distress, the destruction, all of that is the result of evil. And I've been reflecting a lot about this because my parents lived through the Second World War. They were under Nazi and Soviet occupation. They saw the horrors of the Holocaust. Uh, they, my aunt, who's 94 years old in New York City, still tells me how she brought water to the prison and washed the bodies of dead people so that relatives could recognize them. That war took six years. There were seven million residents of Ukraine killed. And then they were refugees for another five years. There's a lot of people who are children or grandchildren of that generation. And they went forward. They gave life. They rebuilt in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine. How do you do that? How do you do that? What is the destruction and what is, what is life? From the first pages of the Bible, we have an answer. God is the giver. He gives Adam and Eve everything. You have everything. Just don't take from that tree because you will die. What does Adam do? He grabs. He takes. He moves away from the life of the gift to the life of the grab. Putin is living the ultimate grab. There's not enough. 11 time zones is not enough. You know, Russia's 28 times as big as Ukraine. You need the 29th part. How much can you eat? How much can you consume? That is evil. And it leads to genocide. It leads to war crimes. The only way to heal is through patient love, to live the give. And already this solidarity, this subsidiarity, the common good, the value of the God-given dignity of a person is the life for the other. So that is, that is the foundation. The psychology, the church life, the business, the business friends, my dear friends, the business, the economy has to be for the other. And there's nothing better than giving. Some people are really discovering that. Isn't it great to give? There's nothing better than to give. If Ukrainians give, 
if you non-Ukrainians give to help Ukrainians, you will see this country is going to be an economic tiger. It's going to be an ecological model. And it will be a place for moral inspiration, not only during war, but during peace. To live the gift, to give, and not to grab. It's hard to even ask a question after such a powerful... <laughs> Powerful, powerful uh, vision that you lay out. Um, can I just ask you, though, that is a, a very powerful view for Ukraine and for Ukrainians. It's also something that applies to everybody else. But do you have a sense of the consequences of this invasion, of this evil, as you put it, on those outside Ukraine? I mean, you, you spend a lot of time in the United States. Do you think that it has had an impact on people who are, who are not direct participants. Sure. Here's father from France. J'étais en France uh, et j'ai vu une chose très, très sympathique pour les Ukrainiens. In France, I was in Bayeux, a regional town. It was night. I walk up uh, to the cathedral. It's open. There's an uh, open house, uh, a light show. You walk in, there's a Ukrainian flag by the European flag and people are praying. I walk out, there's City Hall. And in the shade, I see there's 15 flags. Flag of France, a flag of the European Union, a flag of Bayeux. And on both sides, six, a total of 12 Ukrainian flags. Bayeux, there's nothing Ukrainian in Bayeux. There's no connection with Bayeux. Uh, and the King of Queen was not in Bayeux, maybe if this was Reims. But uh, yeah, there's little flags in, in, in front of uh, the houses in Pennsylvania. It's a big wake up call, Zanny. The world, the world in the 21st century, when everything is almost up for grabs, everything's transactional, we live in a post truth world often, politics, alternative facts, and. In, in, uh, <laughs> in journalism uh, or, not, not or all, propaganda. Yeah. Not, not all, but... Uh, uh, and all of a sudden, somebody is saying somewhere, oh, no, 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 it's not that simple. This is good, and this is absolute evil. That is true, and this is false. And you know what? I'm going to risk my life for it. You know, kids in Paris are not going to give their life for the European flag. But they're looking up. Politicians are looking. Maybe it's not just the business deal with the, you know, North, Northern Pipeline. Maybe we need to maintain principles. Maybe we can't always sell out for the bottom line. And I think that's what, what Ukraine is saying to the world. And the world is interested. Yeah. And that sense that there are values worth, that there worth is, fighting that for. That there are moral objective things. Because the big question is, do we live in a time of moral subjectivity when you can argue for anything? But let me, I, I think that you, you put your finger on something very, very powerful. And that is something that I, I recognize in, in countries far beyond Ukraine. But, but one consequence, you spoke earlier that one of the lessons of this was that you needed love. But these are, at the same time you say this is, it is, you know, we have learnt the need to fight against evil. And I sort of want to put those two together and ask how a society afterwards, I mean, there is evil that you are fighting, but in the aftermath you want to create an inclusive society that is positive. Can you put those two together for me and, you know, there are now perceptions, you know, you use, Ukraine used to you know, view Russia and Russians very, very differently than it does now. Talk me through how, after this war, the new Ukraine will, will feel about its neighbor, about Russians. How, how do you see that, Elena? That's a tough one. We are in a situation whereby we cannot find any empathy to the enemy which is quite natural, I think. And 
they started their aggression with starting uh, uh, to call us nationalists or Nazis even. We didn't have so many nationalists before the all-out war, uh, as many as we have today. Nationalists, um, that is tantamount to the uh, response to this aggression. You start protecting, defending your nation, your nationality against the aggressor. Without the aggressor, uh, the national um, sentiment, the national aspiration is not that uh, stre uh, strong. But now all of our children are becoming nationalists. This cannot be make you happy when your children can tell the sound of a missile uh, flying in um, from uh, the sound of the Iranian drone. But our children can tell the difference between the two sounds. And of course, they have uh, got no empathy to the Russian leaders, to the Russian uh, military, to the Russian citizens as well. When will it change? It can change when uh, this country, which is unfortunately our neighbor, um, realizes at last that they have to repent. They have to um, undo this evil that they brought to our um, country. And we don't know how long it's going to take. And we cannot wait uh, for them to uh, f find their mind again and to become civilized. We have to continue putting up resistance. This is a very difficult situation. You cannot compare it with, uh, say, um, a dysfunctional family where a husband and wife are um, at loggerheads about uh, something. They killed all the empathy, all the friendly feelings that we might have had before towards them, towards their country, towards their people. And I cannot imagine how long, how many decades or even centuries it will take to heal these wounds and to bridge these gaps. I'll try to answer in two parts, and they need to be kept together and not quoted separately. Um, there's, there's a deep problem in Russia and with Russians. There's a deep pathology of imperialism. Russians believe that they have to be an empire, that you have to belong to me. Ukrainians today are saying, you know, Americans are not going to be colonies of the Brits. Uruguay is not going to be a colony of Spain, Algeria, France. Blacks are not going to be the slaves of whites. It's over. Now, the Russians need to understand that. But when not only Putin, the whole political elite, the business elite, 700 university presidents signed a a petition supporting the war. Not a single bishop out of 300 Orthodox bishops has stepped out against the war. And uh, Patriarch Kirill uses jihadist language, saying, if you go and die killing Ukrainians and get killed, your sins will be, uh, will be forgiven. This is a deep, deep problem. It's not one man. This whole idea that it's just Putin it needs to be, it's another illusion, mm -hmm. another illusion. Get it out of your head. Mm -hmm. Tell others to get it out of their head. There's a deep pathology in Russian culture. It's in Russian ballet, it's in Russian literature, it's in Russian schools, and it needs to be dealt with. Now, can it be dealt with? I believe in miracles. I believe in conversion. I believe maybe I will convert someday. Uh, you know, in 1942, Robert Schumann started thinking and writing, how will we French live with the Germans after the defeat of the Nazis? Now, that wasn't something for a discourse in 1942. The war had to be won. Not only the war had to be won, the Nazis had to be defeated. 
The pathology had to be named, it had to be judged, it had to be condemned and sentenced by a Nuremberg trial. And then those ideas of human fellowship, which were being hatched even during the war by those called to this vocation, to which others like de Gaulle joined, Alcide de Gaspari in Italy, uh, Konrad uh, Adenauer. Mm -hmm. And they said, but it was only 1962 really when Adenauer and, uh, and um, de Gaulle met in Reims, where they said, okay, we're going to put a stop to it. It was 17 years after the war. Today, French children and German children have to learn about the war. They don't know about it. But there were two or three generations of exchanges of mutual textbooks, of, of the work of churches, civic organizations, encounters of governments that said, you know what? We can't move to a different continent. Ukraine can't move you know, to the neighborhood of Brazil. Someday, it, Russia will have to understand, I hope not someday, soon, that the God-given dignity of Ukrainians is, is something that they will defend uh, to, to the last do drop of blood. And this Russians need, because it's a terrible thing to be an imperialist. It's a terrible thing to be a slave owner. It's a, it's a blotch. It's, it's a shame. And we need to get Russians out of this by winning this war. That, that is a very um, optimistic, say, parallel in that uh, you're right when you describe what happened in Europe, but it happened in the aftermath of the complete defeat of the Germans and a radical transformation of German society. Do you think that is the sort of necessary ingredient for the, the, the future that you're painting? Because I was very struck by the First Lady saying this is, a, this is decades or possibly centuries. Which, which of those is it? I'm a historian, actually, by training, not a prophet. Uh, <laughs> um, I, think, I think we can learn... Uh, I think it's very simple, uh, and we're seeing it in American history. You know, uh, the, the, the scars of slavery are still there, 150 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, over 50 years after the civil rights laws of the 1960s. We still have deep, deep problems. These things, you know, it's hard to outlaw sin, and sin is that grab. And that's why we have to get on our knees. That is why we need to repent. That is why we need to say, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. And until that becomes also a part of our political language, you know, was it Willy Brandt who, who knelt? That was important. Maybe that was a secular, you know, secular kind of a penitence. But um, it, it can't happen otherwise. It can't. It's not possible. Otherwise, there will be this aggression, there will be these pretenses, there will be whole political systems, academic programs, cultural you know, expressions built on a false and, and, and very dangerous uh, foundation. I hope, I, hope, I hope that can happen. With that, I'd, I'd like to open for questions. We have time for a few questions for this extraordinary conversation. Um, be part of it. There's a microphone. Please put your hand up. Lady there. Yes, right there in the gray jacket. Hello. Thank you for this insightful discussion. Um, my question is to the First Lady of Ukraine, and it's really around women's leadership and, and what it means now. We've seen the failings of leadership, oil and gas, economic, all of that, and women's voices, women's leadership. What do you see going forward and the need for that? Thank you very much for your uh, question. I think 
It is a natural process uh, when the role of women is growing in the society of today. We see the um, aftermath of uh, under-representation of uh, women. Not a single woman who is the defense uh, minister, prime minister, or president that uh, started a war in the 20th century, uh, let alone 21st century. Um, I understand that we add humanity. I, in no way am I uh, diminishing the humanity of men, but uh, women add this uh, human touch, human approach, and it pleases me immensely when I see the growing representation of women at every level of the society, in the civil society and uh, in parliaments, in governments. Uh, in Ukraine, we do not have to discuss uh, equal opportunities or to prove that women should uh, be at par with, uh, uh, with uh, men. Uh, during the war, we don't see the d any difference between the roles of men and women because everyone contributes what he or she uh, is capable of contributing. More than 30,000 women volunteered to fight at the front line. So they joined the military when the war started. So that's their um, uh, totally conscious choice. Uh, and a lot of men are now taking care of children because uh, they haven't got uh, their mothers to do that. So it's not the change of roles. It's the testament of our living in the society of equal opportunity. And I hope that it will continue to be so. And um, as I said before, I'm sure that uh, this uh, um, feminine uh, touch, uh, this soft power that we wield, uh, we women, will help all of us. Your Eminence, you wanted to ask the First Lady a question too on this. Pani Oleno, Oleno, I'm getting to know you and and your, your uh, image and your posture, uh, the, your beautiful language, your warm smile. If, if I may, uh, as you mentioned in um, the interview uh, to BBC, that you are addressing thousands as if there were only three people. If you could address millions of mothers in China, in India, in s southern um, America could say something about Ukrainian children and what these people can do to uh, build the support uh, for Ukrainian uh, children. Of Africa, China, India, of other countries, about the children of Ukraine and what they can do to help protect uh, those children that you know and love. <laughs> A child uh, in any country is a child, and a mother in any country is a mother. So um, at this level, we should uh, ask them to imagine what happens if your child is killed, your innocent child is killed. And under the circumstances, you cannot uh, uh, remain indifferent. Uh, you cannot imagine not taking sides. Um, you cannot imagine uh, failing to cry together with Ukrainian mothers standing uh, on the sidelines. So I want them to feel our pain and uh, to make sure that their politicians realize uh, that when innocent suffer, it means that the world is not fair, that the war is not just. And it is very easy now to take sides. Either you stand for uh, violence and evil, or you stand for the good and you defend your people. And if you fail to make the right choice, then you will be forced to do that sooner or later. 
the criminals will force you to make your choice. So in order not to become a victim, you have to start talking, to start acting. You have to raise your voice uh, um, and talk to your uh, politicians. Unfortunately, many of them uh, keep silent. There will be no neutrality um, eventually uh, because you should understand what's black and what's white. Um, and for the good to prevail, it would be logical, it would be a right to stand on the side of the good. There's a question here from a lady at the front. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Terry Kennedy with Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. Good to see you again. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your foundation and any way that we could help to support what you're doing? Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. A very timely question. Um, I uh, will be uh, speaking uh, about it um, at a lot of meetings in Davos. Uh, Olena Fan, um, Zelenska Foundation is about uh, collecting humanitarian aid. We've uh, managed um, so far to assist thousands of people who flee from uh, occupied territories and those who are currently in uh, recently deoccupied ones. We are helping to restore schools um, uh, and um, hospitals. We uh, fund uh, raise funds for that, uh, and we are designing a project related to the children's needs, uh, support of uh, family um, um, type um, institutions for children. Uh, unfortunately, there are still a, a lot of institutionalized uh, children and. Um, uh, these institutions should be uh, dropped gradually on our way to uh, the uh, European Union. Uh, the child should be uh, raised in family or uh, in the conditions that are as close to the family ones as possible. So these uh, uh, family-based um, uh, care homes for children are uh, the target of our assistance. Uh, we work together with uh, uh, different um, charities and we work with families who have got up to 10 foster children uh, and they are going through very hard times. Uh, they have been displaced to other uh, regions of Ukraine from uh, either uh, recently deoccupied uh, territories or those very close to the front line. So we've initiated the project to provide assistance to uh, those um, uh, families with foster children, uh, to provide housing to them and to build houses for uh, other families who would volunteer to uh, adopt or uh, have foster children. And we trained dozens of families uh, willing to do so in the future, um, uh, who want to institute such family-based uh, care homes for children uh, so that they are well prepared for this work because it is hard work. And now we are trying to uh, help uh, children's institutions that have been evacuated abroad. We um, want uh, them, when they return to Ukraine, to uh, be dispersed as institutions for children and for the children to find families. Uh, you know that uh, now um, because of um, uh, the uh, combat uh, actions, uh, a lot of children uh, remain orphans. And we have to uh, concentrate uh, political, economic, and uh, financial effort uh, to support these forms of raising children. And I'm looking for partners here in Davos to support us financially and to support us with um, construction uh, materials. We need uh, the houses that will be uh, energy efficient and energy independent that will have actually shelters, um, uh, which is a necessity under the circumstances of Ukraine today. Uh, the houses that are quick to uh, build and uh, uh, easy to maintain. And we contact also construction companies, uh, large com uh, construction companies, and we also rely on their expertise and support. I think we have time for one more question. Is there one more? Yes, gentlemen there, standing up, exactly. Coming. 
Hi, I'm from Washington, D.C., and I've uh, been working for three uh, Ukrainian humanitarian organizations in the United States to raise millions of dollars uh, for ambulances and other relief, especially helping the orphanages. And what I've noticed recently, the average American has contributed almost $80 uh, out of 350 million people. That's not a bad average. But what I've noticed recently is there's Ukraine fatigue. Everybody was really hoping this war would be over by now, and they're wondering why it's not. That's not an answer for you all. How do I keep my donors inspired, excited about giving and helping Ukraine? That is a very, very good question. Maybe first we'll go to the Archbishop and then to you, Elena. Uh, how do you counter Ukraine fatigue? How do you keep uh, the donors inspired? I'll start from the second question. And you can't do this with 300 million people, but the best way to get your leaders fired up and keep them fired up is to go to Ukraine to visit. Uh, and not only Lviv, but you know, to go to Kiev, to Bucha, and if possible to Kharkiv and other places in the east. Uh, I think everybody that's been there uh, uh, receives such inspiration that you know, lasts, lasts for a long time. It's natural. It's natural you know, for our, our attention to w wane. We live in a time of very, very short attention spans. I think Hollywood now for children's movies makes scenes no longer than three seconds or two seconds because it has to be switched all the time. Uh, so I would say it's a miracle that Ukraine is still on the front pages. It's not only a miracle, it's the devastation, it's the clarity, the black and white clarity. We just have to work. And those of us who are engaged uh, in it have to work harder. Because we might think that, you know, we've been working so hard. But as long as we do what we can do, you know, today, we can go to sleep and say, Lord, you know, this is your world, uh, take over. Uh, we shouldn't beat ourselves, you know. Um, yeah, we, we, we need to, to be realistic. Um, but I, I believe, I believe that, uh, you know, the world is, is making a difference. You know, you've collected millions, I've collected millions, other people have collected millions, maybe tens of millions. But with a stroke of a pen, the President of the United States mandated billions. We have to keep working with the politicians. The politicians that they don't make stupid choices, short-sighted choices. That's the real strategic thing. Because uh, I don't know how much, uh, you know, you'll do the math later. You know, the, the two aid packages, it's close to 100 billion already. That's divided by 300 million. That's probably $10,000 per, per, per American or something like that. I might be wrong by a zero. <laughs> uh, I, 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 not quick enough. So let's just keep on working. And... Maybe this won't apply to, you know, the secular people. But I'll tell you, as a person of faith, we can't do it without God. You'll tire out, you'll, you'll pucker, you know, something will give up. We need God's grace for this. And I can tell you, having tried with all my failings to give my whole life to other people, um, every time I get tired, after every decade, after every failure, uh, when I pray, the Lord gives new strength, and I hope to keep going forward. I think all of us understand that Ukraine is uh, fighting this kinetic war, but uh, the moral war is uh, being waged against the entire world, and all of us need this common victory. I will tell your daughters something like this. If you are tired, if you feel this fatigue, you can just take rest or... My, um, 
take a break. But imagine what happens if Ukrainians take a break, if they uh, get tired and they stop and say, OK, we do not go on. Be what may. Just address this issue on your own. We will go, say, to America, to Australia, uh, to Europe, and then Europe will be uh, left to its own devices. Uh, we uh, have no right to stop, to be fatigued, to be tired, and we hope that you will share this emotion. Another uh, aspect is uh, uh, totally practical. You provided us with so much help, and if you stop now, it was mean that all the previous help was totally in vain. Um, one cannot stop. Um, uh, this, um, extinguishing the fire when half of the f um, uh, house is in flames. Otherwise, the entire house will burn down. Uh, and it will um, mean that you um, either do everything or you do nothing. That is a very powerful note to end on, but I just want, because we have one minute left, I would love to end, because this is a forward-looking conversation. It's been an amazingly interesting conversation. Paint me briefly a picture of the Ukraine that emerges from the end. Just pick out one or two things of what, what there will be in, in the Ukraine that is, you are creating through this extraordinary difficult episode. <laughs> To me, it is a country of my dream. We all work together towards seeing this uh, country of uh, dream, the country of equal opportunities, a country of uh, people who value one another and their future, a country that treasures all of its partners throughout the world, all of its neighbors, uh, that a country that can uh, sustain peace because it appreciates uh, the value and the price of this peace. And it will be the backbone of peace and security in the world in the future. I dream of a Ukraine that uh, gives life to a lot of children, where children are welcome, where children are free. Uh, where children are surrounded by a beautiful ecology. I dream of a country that continues to give bread to Africa, to the Middle East, to starving populations. I dream of a country where they're not number three or four among the computer outsources, but they're one or two. Um, I dream of a country that all of you will want to visit. I dream of a country that begins singing again uh, and teaches the world to sing. I dream of a country where people coming out of this solidarity really look at each other face to face and say, We want to live personally, not only virtually. I dream of a country that helps change the world. I think the beginning is there. What a place to end. Thank you.